morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you're located across Canada. And there are a number of people across Canada joined us today, so I want to welcome all of you. My name is Jennifer Campbell, and I'm a project lead here at the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. And I'm really pleased to be moderating this session today. So I do want to welcome you. And just a reminder that for this session, the only people who can speak will be the moderators. And so we will re rely on the chat function for your questions and comments throughout the session. If you have questions and comments, please do use the chat box at the bottom left of the Blackboard window. And when you hit return or enter, they will appear for all, um, in all the participants to see. We will hold all the questions um, and have a question and answer session at the end. And uh, give you, uh, but please do feel free to post any comments, questions throughout the session as we continue. Okay. There we go. I want to introduce to you today's presenters. First, we have Dr. Nancy Edwards. She is a distinguished professor at the University of Ottawa and a full professor in the School of Nursing. She was appointed as the scientific director with the Institute of Population and Public Health with CIHR in July 2008. Dr. Edwards obtained her undergraduate nursing degree from the University of Windsor and completed graduate studies in epidemiology at McMaster and McGill Universities. She is a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences and has been awarded two honorary doctorate degrees. Dr. Edwards' clinical and research interests are in the fields of public and population health, and she has conducted health services, policy, and clinical research both nationally and internationally. Her research has informed the design and evaluation of complex multi-level and multi-strategy community health programs. Her work in global health has spanned four continents where she's led both development-oriented and research-focused topics. And also, as uh, one of the main um, presenters today, Dr. Christina Wolfson, uh, one of the co-PIs of the CLSA. Uh, Dr. Wolfson is a professor in the Department of Medicine and in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics and Occupational Health at McGill University, where she is also an associate member in the Departments of Neurology and Neurosurgery and the Department of Mathematics and Statistics. She is the Program Director for the NMS National Education and Training Program. Uh, she's a Fellow of the American College of Epidemiology and her program of research lies in population-based research in neurodegenerative disorders, including multiple sclerosis. Um, sorry, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, and epilepsy. So as I said, she is one of the three co-principal investigators of the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. And uh, so I want to welcome both of our speakers today. And today we're going to hear about um, the data access portal and uh, of the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. And with that, I want to um, turn things over to Dr. Nancy Edwards to bring greetings from CIHR. I'll start with an Australian expression, good day, because that covers afternoon and morning and our time zones in Canada. Uh, it's delightful to be here and to be uh, co-presenting with Tina. Tina taught me statistics at McGill many years ago, and I can tell you she's a fantastic teacher, as well as being a superb scientist. So I'm um, really looking forward to her talk. Uh, so everybody, just on behalf of um, CIHR and the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, I want to welcome you to this webinar, um, which is going to feature the data preview portal for the CLSA. And I'm here on behalf of CIHR. I'm one of two scientific champions from among the 13 CIHR institutes. Uh, Dr. Yves Joinette, who I think many of you know, is the other scientific director champion um, at the Institute of Aging. Um, he wasn't able to join us today. But he sends his best regards and uh, his warmest congratulations to the CLSA team for meeting what is really a historic milestone, um, the release of the CLSA data for use by the research community across this country. CIHR has uh, supported the development of the CLSA for over a decade now, hard to believe. Um, and indeed, the work of the CLSA and the data generated is not only of interest to researchers in the realm of uh, aging and science and also population and public health, but um, also is certainly of interest um, to, I think, all areas um, of CIHR's uh, 13 institutes. And we have 
many discussions um, about the CLSA um, at Science Council, so all institute directors really have uh, some significant engagement in this. This slide um, does remind us that it's, uh, it's no secret that the population is aging. I see it when I look in the mirror every morning. Um, and you can see here the projections um, showing that the percentage of seniors aged 75 and higher is uh, rising significantly. Um, and we have uh, many decision makers who are concerned about this and um, I, I hear this talked about in, in many of the uh, venues where I spend some of my time. Um, this just shows the, the grand opening of the CLSA um, in September of 2012 at McMaster University. Um, this involves an investment from CIHR of over $65 million and that has helped to create the CLSA and support its implementation. Um, it's a very important platform uh, for research uh, in this country. It was one of the uh, first major actions led by the CIHR's Institute of Aging, but as I mentioned, strongly supported by all other CIHR institutes. Um, and its deployment now has been has spanned uh, three scientific directors of the Institute of Aging, uh, Dr. Adrian Hebert, uh, Dr. Anne Martin Matthews, and now Dr. Eve Joannette. And all have worked uh, very closely with the CLSA investigators and the research community um, to help provide the support that's needed to get this off the ground. CIHR uh, continues to support uh, the ongoing development of what really is a unique longitudinal platform um, and it's among the most comprehensive of its kind in the world. And I think finally the long-term vision and investment that began nearly a decade ago has started to pay off and it's very exciting times. As uh, you'll hear from Dr. Wilson in just a few minutes, the CLSA's goal of reaching 50,000 participants is very close to being met. Um, as the number of Canadians who have completed telephone or home, in-home interviews and data collection sites has now surpassed 46,000. This is a highly anticipated milestone. The CLSA is a unique longitudinal platform for the Canadian and the international research community. Um, it focuses on the determinants of active aging as well as the trajectory leading to health changes in older age. It's a platform for science, that's how we refer to it at Science Council. It's therefore a resource for Canadian and international researchers to draw on. Now I'll highlight um, just a couple of strategic initiatives of CIHR that I think illustrate the potential for application of CLSA data across a number of initiatives within the organization. So the Work in Health uh, Signature Initiative, um, one of our most recently launched initiatives, um, that involves uh, extensive work and retirement modules um, in the CLSA that you'll hear more about uh, today. Uh, the Environments and Health Signature Initiative um, is another example where we have a platform component um, which will help to enable linkage of CLSA data on the health of participants to other kinds of data such as air pollution data from Health Canada or potential linkages to data on things like land use patterns, walkability, urban design and transportation systems. A third initiative is the Canadian Consortium on Neurodegeneration and Aging and here we see um, efforts to harmonize data across studies and um, a an very important focus on cognitive impairment and aging. And of course um, CIHR's open program competition, um, particularly the project scheme but also the foundation scheme provide opportunities to use the CLSA data and um, applications uh, in that realm would be eligible and very welcome. I want to um, uh, finish off my part here by just congratulating uh, Dr. Parminder, Parminder Reyna at McMaster University who I've known for a long time, Christina Wilson at McGill um, and Susan Kirkland at Dalhousie University as well as the entire CLSA team of over 160 co-investigators and collaborators. Uh, their, their work has been monumental. Um, we should celebrate the scientific vision and the generosity of all those who make the CLSA possible, including the 46,000 in, in climbing Canadians, the CLSA participants, who are absolutely fundamental to advances uh, to science that lie ahead. 
So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Tatiana. So um, thank you um, very much for inviting me to, to give this webinar. I'm hoping that my um, microphone is working correctly. So what I wanted to do today, uh, first of all, I have to say that I have far more slides than I would ever recommend my students use in a presentation. So I'm gonna, I might be a little bit selective towards the end so that we get a chance to get your questions and hopefully your input. Um, I know I'm going to leave something out. This is a very, very large undertaking for one person to speak about, and certainly I am presenting this on behalf of First and foremost, my two co-principal investigators, Parminder and Susan, uh, we've been together since the onset of this idea, uh, which was actually in 2001. So it's, it's actually quite a bit more than, than a decade. Um, I will talk primarily about the CLSA as a platform. Um, I, I kind of live in two worlds in relation to the CLSA. For me, it's a research study, a research project, the largest I've ever been involved in but nevertheless a research project. But it is also uh, a national research platform, and that's really what I'm going to concentrate on today. What I will talk about is I'll give a little bit of background. Uh, I am going to talk about the methods. I think anyone interested in using data should know a little bit more about the methods. I'll talk about the content, uh, how it was developed, and some information uh, on the content itself. I'm going to give a little bit of an update on the status of the study, and I can actually increase uh, Nancy's numbers as of today. Uh, I, I will give what I call, in quotes, some results. Uh, basically, I'm going to give you a little bit of a teaser about some of the information that is available in the CLSA, some summary statistics. Then I'm going to talk about access and I will uh, refer to our data preview portal. If I have time, and, and I'm going to monitor this very closely because the very important thing is to get your questions, I will talk about the follow-up, some changes that are planned, modifications, uh, and additions uh, to the follow-up. And then I think Nancy's coming on for a couple more slides at the end. So if that's okay, or as, as used to be said when I was little, if everyone's sitting comfortably, I'll begin. So I think you know this already, anyone who's visited the website or seen uh, anything uh, in the news recently, 50,000, the goal, the target is 50,000 participants from across the country, uh, a little bit more, a little bit different from other studies of aging. Uh, we're recruiting people between the ages of 45 and 85 at baseline to try and capture uh, not only the older uh, individuals, but also the baby boomers. It's a 20-year study, I like to say at least 20 years, uh, with major data collection waves every three years. And, and as already been noted, there are more than 160 researchers and 26 institutions who have been involved in the planning and the development and the implementation of the study. And it goes without saying uh, that it covers many different domains uh, of research. Uh, we have a vision, uh, and our vision is the platform, uh, the study as well as the platform, even beyond uh, the, the CLSA itself, because as part of our activities as a team, we've also built an infrastructure uh, for uh, research and aging uh, across Canada that potentially can be used by, by others. Just putting in, so I can't resist, it's putting in some timelines. Uh, a request for applications was sent out in 2001 in November, I remember it distinctly, uh, with a deadline for submission uh, of January 2002, so three months uh, to put together an application to develop the protocol. Along the way, uh, we've been funded by CIHR to develop the protocol, to conduct feasibility studies, to do validation studies and pilot studies at each point, and little IR means we had international review. Uh, in 2011, uh, we separately went ahead and, well, before 2011, but we applied for and were successful in obtaining a Canada Foundation for Innovation Award that allowed us to build the infrastructure upon which uh, the CLSA sits. We then began recruitment uh, for the, uh, the baseline, for the cohort itself, and baseline data collection. And we anticipate in the summer of 2015, so I keep saying that, but it's really just a few months, we will begin the first uh, follow-up of all 50,000 of our participants. 
We have a very large research team. I said 160 investigators. I just wanted to highlight uh, the individuals who are involved more closely uh, with the developments and the, certainly in the implementation uh, across Canada. Uh, already mentioned by Nancy, the major platform funding, and I put dash one because there is a dash two, which is really good news. $23.5 million from CRHR for the first five years, representing 86% uh, of the required budget with the, um, the research team coming up with the remaining. Canada Foundation for Innovation and Infrastructure Grant of 20, uh, $26.5 million. This is uh, one of the things I refer to as the infrastructure. We have a National Coordinating Center at McMaster University directed by Parminder Reina. We also have built a biorepository and bioanalysis center for the CLSA, which is also located at McMaster. We have a genetics and epigenetics center uh, located um, at the University of British Columbia, and the statistical analysis center, which is located uh, at McGill, and I'm, I'm actually sitting there uh, right now. The additional infrastructure are our in-person data collection sites, and we have 11 of these sites, uh, which have been built to very strict protocol and standards and to allow us to implement the study in the same way across all of the sites. So although they, they might look a little bit different, we have exactly the same uh, equipment and layout in each of these sites, and this is uh, funded by the CFI. We have a computer-assisted telephone interview uh, sites at the University of Manitoba, Dalhousie, University of Sherbrooke, and Simon Fraser. We previously had one uh, also at the University of Victoria. Again, uh, the infrastructure uh, funding for that came from the CFI. So jumping right into uh, the meat here, the, the methods. This slide, which is a little bit busy, but hopefully gives you an idea of the design uh, overview. Uh, target 50,000 men and women between the ages of 45 and 85 at baseline. I'm trying to figure out where I can get some things to. I think I can use this. Can, I? can anybody? Can you see the pointer? If I use the pointer, just trying to figure out how to use the pointer. Here we go. Is that a pointer? Someone say yes if they can see the pointer. Yeah. Don't see it. Okay. Okay. Oh. Oh well. I can just do directions. So look on the left side of this um, slide. So on the left side of the slide, you'll see a box that says N equals 20,000. Uh, those individuals are what we call the tracking cohort. They have been randomly selected within all 10 provinces, and they are interviewed uh, over the telephone by using a questionnaire using computer-assisted telephone interviews. So staying, staying on the left side and moving down, uh, those individuals undergo a full follow-up every three years, and we, we do a maintaining contact telephone interview in between uh, the waves, and at the end of the day, we will also be doing uh, data linkage. So on the left-hand side, we have what we call the tracking cohort telephone interviews, uh, about 60-minute interview uh, that have already been done. On the right-hand side, uh, we have what we call a comprehensive cohort, 30,000 uh, individuals who are randomly selected uh, located within 25 to 50 kilometers of our 11 data collection sites. These folks um, undergo an in-home questionnaire, which is, is essentially the same as the telephone interview done by the other 20,000. So when we're done, we'll have 50,000 uh, with the same inf information by questionnaire. Those individuals then come in uh, to the data collection site and they undergo some physical assessments, clinical assessments. If they agree, they provide a blood sample and a urine sample uh, in our, uh, one of our 11 data collection sites. They also follow the same uh, strategy for follow-up, full follow-up every three years with maintaining contact in between and at the end of the day, data linkage. We opted for this kind of a design because for 50,000 people, it was just prohibitively expensive uh, to be able to have all 50,000 people come in uh, to data collection sites. And we also knew that we would not be able to have a random sample across all of Canada uh, in that way because people had to be able uh, to come uh, to the site. But, and, and in fact, we can get some really nice provincial level estimates uh, with our tracking cohort. So that's the, generally the overview. And you'll find all this material on our website uh, for those of you who want to do some, some homework afterwards. 
So the study is national in scope, and what we found with this uh, figure, this map of Canada, is the blue dots represent generally uh, the fact that we are able to conduct our telephone interviews for our tracking cohort across the country. The red dots uh, are the locations of the data collection sites where the staff are sent out to do the home interviews and the participants come in. So you'll see we are, we, our data collection sites, we do not have data collection sites in, in every province, uh, but we're doing a pretty good job. But we do have the telephone interview cohort uh, in every province. So just talking about recruitment, um, we started out this uh, process partnering with Statistics Canada. We worked closely with them uh, designing the CCHS 4.2 Healthy Aging Study, and we actually used participants in that study as a partial sampling frame for the CLSA. Uh, these were individuals who had agreed to share their contact information. This didn't yield enough participants, so we ended up partnering also with Provincial Ministries of Health as a second sampling frame using health registration databases, and finally our third sampling frame was random digit dialing. Uh, Sampling weights, when we release the data, as we release the data, sampling weights have been uh, computed at, at this point for all of the individuals in the tracking cohort. So those are available uh, with the data. We do have some exclusion criteria. And the exclusion criteria really are based on the CCHS exclusion criteria, as we started with that as our sampling frame and we needed to be consistent. So it uh, excludes the residents of the three territories. It excludes individuals living in an institution, living on First Nations reserves. It excludes full-time current members of the armed forces, people who hold temporary visas, those with cognitive impairment, and those unable to communicate in French or, or in English. So we have built those into uh, the recruitment strategies to keep it in line with our original sampling frame. Talk about content development. Um, this study is a scientific study. It is not just a collection uh, of data without thought. There was a lot of thought that went into developing the content. Uh, so this has been done by the scientific management team and content uh, working groups who have been essential in providing and uh, justifying and validating and updating the content that we should be including uh, in a long-term study of aging. One of the things that we have been doing all along also is to compare what we're including, or what we were going to include in the beginning, with what's being done in other large-scale scale studies. So we've looked at uh, you know, what's included in the Health and Retirement Study, the CPTP, the, um, the, the Partnership for Tomorrow Project. Uh, we've also looked at ELSA, the cohort constance in France. So we've done a lot of work, uh, particularly with the Maelstrom Research Group in Montreal led by Isabel Fortier, uh, to look at the potential for harmonization uh, across different cohorts. We, we didn't go the route that we would have exactly what other people were using because of, there are some differences in what we needed to include relative to other studies, but we are cognizant uh, of the potential for harmonization uh, along the way. So in the tracking, the telephone interview, uh, these are the modules and the questionnaires are all available uh, on the website, so please take a look at those uh, when you have a little bit more time. So clearly socio-demographics, we actually added a, a veteran identifier question to determine if there were veterans, Canadian veterans in the, uh, in the study. We have lifestyle questions, of course health questions, this is all self-report, telephone administered functional status, uh, we do cognitive, uh, some cognitive testing and everything is audio taped and then is scored afterwards. So we do the RAE, the mental alternation test and animal naming, depression, satisfaction with life, social networks, caregiving and receiving injuries, labor force, income. Uh, so all of that information is in, uh, I see the question already, I'll get to you later about the cognitive impairment. Uh, so, so all of that information is in the, uh, the tracking module. I will talk a little bit about the comprehensive, that is the 30,000 who come in. Although those data are not yet uh, available, we are still uh, doing at the last stages of finalizing uh, collection on the, the last of the 50, at the last of the 30,000, but I do think I need to talk about it for completeness. Uh, the comprehensive have basically the same uh, computer-assisted telephone interview content. They don't have the social support module which has been moved to the data collection site, so they get that later. 
but they have additional uh, questions on, there's a short diet questionnaire, there are questions on sleep, and we also ask them uh, to bring, to show their medication to the interviewer. So we have a, a module on medications where they're asked for the medications and the DIN numbers. In addition, at the data collection site, uh, we complete a contraindications questionnaire. So A, we know what tests we can do on people, and B, if it, there's some information in that that helps us to interpret the results of the assessments that are done. We do a disease symptoms questionnaire, uh, which has uh, a lot more information uh, about disease, uh, obviously disease symptoms. So for instance, we ask the WHO ROSE questionnaire, uh, and we, we do a screening questionnaire for Parkinson's disease, et cetera. And as I noted, we do social support, social participation, uh, physical assessments, and blood and urine. Okay, I think I must have missed the fact that we do additional cognitive tests also at the data collection site. I knew it would forget something. Uh, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a flow at the data collection site. So the arrows hopefully will uh, allow you to follow through if you can't see my little arrow that I'm using. So people start at reception. Uh, they're registered, they do the contraindications questionnaire, they move to another measurement room where you see uh, the information that's collected on them there, uh, the physical measures that are done. Uh, they then go into measurement room two where there's a DEXA, uh, in, and then they move into measurement room three where we do uh, visual testing, visual assessments, grip strength, and we start with some additional neuropsychological testing. They then go into the hallway, which we also use for data collection where they do some performance testing. They then go into another room and have hearing, uh, the disease symptoms questionnaire, and the second part uh, of the neuropsych testing. They then provide the urine sample, then there's the blood draw, and then they check out. Uh, we give them uh, a few uh, of the results from right from what we've just done on them. We give them a little snack, and we give them $30 uh, reimbursement for any kind of travel uh, costs they may have had. And they're there for about two and a half to three hours at the data collection site. So we also, I mentioned we also have the maintaining contact, which is about a 30-minute interview, which we're cur is currently ongoing, uh, where we've added some additional components that we weren't able to fit uh, into uh, the, the baseline way. So I just wanted to make a couple of comments okay. here is that the CLSA is a paperless uh, study. Everything is electronic. Uh, we have, of course, we have paper in case we have no uh, internet access, but basically everything is paperless at this point. All the information is stored and then exported uh, onto secure servers. So you see we begin by pre-recruitment, uh, participants consent to participate. They then provide their questionnaire data. Uh, the questionnaire data are stored at the statistical analysis center where all uh, validation and data cleaning takes place and where the data are prepared for dissemination for researchers. At uh, the data collection site visit, all of the alphanumeric data and also the images are also sent to the statistical analysis center and to the national coordinating center. The biological specimens are sent to our uh, biorepository and bioanalysis center. So this is all electronic. So let me give you, I know I'm whizzing through this, uh, but I just want to get to access. So let me tell you about status so you know where we are. So for the telephone interviews, which I've called the tracking uh, cohort, we finished our recruitment and baseline assessment of our target of 20,000. We actually ended up with 21,241 uh, because we, at some point, at one point in time, we realized we were not capturing the low SES group, so we did a little bit of additional sampling and kept those, uh, kept the, the full sample, so we now have 21,241. So these data are available for release to researchers and in fact have already been released um, uh, to two uh, sets of research teams. Okay. The maintaining contact interviews that were started in 2013 about 13,000 of those have been completed with about 4% loss, and that includes deaths as well as withdrawal. So it's looking pretty good. And we will begin the first follow-up uh, this summer. Now, I do want to note that at, at, as of today, the cognition data and some of the open text um, have not yet been uh, released uh, in the first release, but should be available in the second release uh, very soon. So for the comprehensive cohort, still um, completing data collection for some of those 30,000. 
So right now, and I think these numbers are higher than Nancy would have said, so we've completed 29,243 in-home interviews from our target of 30,000, which is pretty good. Uh, of that, because there is a delay, one two-week delay in, in uh, coming to the DCS, we've done 26,656 DCS visits. These data, because of course they're not yet complete and have not yet been fully cleaned, although cleaning is ongoing, will only be released um, sometime next year, hopefully spring. And we've started maintaining contact with those folks as well. And again, we have about 4% lost. Uh, and we will begin the first follow-up uh, in the summer of 2015. So we're very, very close to our target. So here are my results. And I'm only going to talk about the tracking data because um, these are only these are the only data that are available for release at this time. And I want to acknowledge that I've pulled some of these uh, slides directly from presentations that, that were given previously at the Canadian Association of Gerontology because um, I, I don't actually have access uh, to, to the data to be able to do multiple analyses uh, for, for this presentation. So I've pulled on uh, other results. So just to give you an idea, uh, we, uh, we have the raw counts and the raw percentages and also uh, applying the sampling weights. I can just give you the age distribution. Um, you know, we can, it's not surprising uh, that, you know, we can see there's a slight difference between the raw uh, percentages and the weighted percentages because we are talking about, uh, you know, a, a sample. So these people are ultimately selected in some way that they wish to volunteer for such a study. Uh, Male-female, um, we have about 25% uh, French speaking uh, who are included in this. And I'm just trying to get rid of, oh yeah, and about 84% uh, have reported that they're uh, born in Canada. So look, just looking at province, uh, this, and again, uh, you can see here, so I think we've done pretty well in terms of the tracking telephone interviews. Uh, we have a reasonable distribution, this pretty much follows the, the provincial size, I think, in terms of uh, the size of the sample and the tracking. So I'll just give you a second to look at that. Obviously, Quebec and Ontario are, are, have the largest sample. Just pulling some, uh, some features out about the chronic conditions, just looking at arthritis, COPD, hypertension, uh, dementia. There was a question here about cognitive uh, impairment. I mean, we, we used a, a similar strategy to Statistics Canada. It was the interviewers actually were the ones who determined whether they felt the person was able to participate. So there were people who came into the study and said yes, that they had received the diagnosis of dementia or Alzheimer's disease. From the telephone interview perspective, we right now until we get any kind of healthcare utilization data, we can't verify that. Uh, but uh, that, those are the data we have at this point. So we have Parkinson's disease or Parkinsonism cancer and osteoporosis and, their, and the weighted values you'll see there too. So just looking at marital status, uh, again, this is really just to give you some basic snapshot teaser information. There's a lot of data here, a large numbers of different kinds of groups, so the educational groups. Um, and as you see, we, were, we felt we were a little low. Uh, on our lesson secondary, so we did some additional sampling in um, postal code regions where we knew that there would be uh, lower SES, and so that has helped to improve uh, our data. Annual income. So looking at some things like self-rated health, uh, again, uh, raw percentages and weighted percentages. Excellence, very, very, it's not surprising, a lot of people consider themselves to be in excellence or very good health. Uh, Self-reportive weight and it's self-report uh, for, for this, this group. Uh, it's not uh, measured at this point. Satisfaction with life. Uh, you can't see that. I see that the logo's on top of it, but the numbers are very similar. 9.8% dissatisfied in the raw and also in the weighted 4 and 4.5, 86 and, and 85. I pulled out another set of slides because we have individuals, of course, who are very interested in looking at the retirement uh, information that we have available in the CLSA. We have a lot, uh, quite an extensive module on retirement. These are already weighted and they come from the tracking cohort. And uh, so if you can look here, the percentage of people who are completely retired, partially retired, not retired, 
uh, the percentage of people who have retired and returned to work, which is, of course is a very interesting uh, phenomenon. And, and looking just you know, from my own curiosity, looking at the people 65 to 85, we've got 26.5% of the males say they're retired and they've returned to work of those who have retired. Very interesting. So 20, you know, a quarter of those people. So looking at those who are not retired, looking to see the percentage who are currently working, and then also the percentage of people who have more than one job. What I'm trying to do here is to just give you a taste that we've got uh, information uh, on lots and lots of different variables for, for obviously for the research community uh, to pull out and, and propose to do their own uh, studies with. I wanted to. I do want to draw attention to the work and retirement modules because there. Some people think that the, you know, the CLSA is a study just of diseases. It's not just a study of diseases. Uh, we have a lot of information on some of the other, many of the other aspects of living as you age. So, for instance, we've got age at retirement, spouses retirement status, reasons for retirement, preparation for retirement, return to work after retirement, reasons for return, full time, part time type of work, etc. We also have included a retirement planning module because we have a large number of people who are not at uh, usual retirement ages. So we ask them when they plan to retire, how they're preparing for that, uh, the adequacy of their income, and the reasons for planned retirement. It's going to be very interesting over time to go back to the same people and see how their plans played out uh, three years, six years, nine years from now. General health function, uh, general health and function, again, just to give you a little bit of a taste, here's a graph of the, of the self rate of health, just so you can see. Uh, I don't think that this is unusual for a large scale study. Uh, people generally self rate their health as, as quite good, even, even when they have a number of chronic conditions. Looking at functional measures, 10% uh, who reported that they had difficulty uh, walking alone up and down stairs. 37%, interestingly enough, more than 37% talked about finding it difficult to follow conversations if there's background noise. So we have information, self-report information on, on hearing and on vision. So hearing, is your hearing using a hearing aid if you use one excellent uh, all the way to poor? Uh, so, you know, I, I don't do research in hearing. I'm sure that this is something that others would, would be looking at just in terms of social, social isolation as well. Uh, one of the particular things that interests me, I'm interested in veterans' health. We included at the baseline uh, a set of veterans identifier questions um, with funding from Veterans Affairs Canada. And as it turns out, it, just in the 20,000 uh, participants we have in the tracking cohort, there's 1,763 people self-reported themselves as veterans, which is 8% uh, of our sample. If this 8% continues through uh, into the comprehensive, we will have one of the largest veterans cohorts in Canada following forward in terms of, of health, physical and mental health. So that's a, an, an interesting concept that within a study that really is not targeted to this, if you, you can add something and generate a, a whole sub area of research that one didn't anticipate. So now I'm going to talk about access. I'm cognizant, uh, cognizant of the time here. So I'm only going to talk about access to the alphanumeric data from the tracking cohort members, 21,241, who completed 60 minutes uh, computer-assisted telephone interviews. So the whole, one of the main principles behind the CLSA is that the data and, in time, the biospecimens will be available to the research community. That's a fundamental tenet of what we're doing. In doing that, though, we have to ensure that the privacy and the consent of participants have to be protected and respected. So this is why we have an access process that we ask all applicants, including uh, researchers who are part of the CLSA team, uh, to adhere to. In being awarded, if you like, or approved access to these data, we also have to ensure that the confidentiality and the security of the data and biospecimens have to be safeguarded, so we do ask uh, approved applicants to engage in a CLSA access agreement where all of these requirements for confidentiality and security are stipulated. Clearly this is a unique resource and so we do want to ensure that it's used optimally. So we do, as I said, so we do have a process in place uh, in order to try and 
ensure that we do the right thing with these data, uh, things that the participants are expecting us to do with them and in line with the consents that they've given. I've tried to streamline uh, what the process is, breaking it down into steps. All of this information, of course, is on our uh, CLSA uh, website. So the first step, of course, is one would have to submit the application. The form is available on the data preview portal. And at the bottom, I put in green the email address uh, that I ask people to submit uh, their request to. First, we do an administrative review. We need to make sure that all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed before we submit the application to the Data and Sample Access Committee for review. They conduct their review and they then make a recommendation to the scientific management team uh, whether or not they propose that the application be approved or, or not be approved or be conditionally approved, uh, depending uh, various components that need to be completed, and then the applicant is, no is notified. Based on our experience so far, I think I can quite comfortably say that the first four steps take three to four weeks. The next step is that the CLS a CLSA access agreement needs to be prepared and signed, and this access agreement is between the McMaster University and the host institution uh, of the individual who has approved uh, access, who has been approved the application. This is a time frame that, that we really have very little control over. And um, depending on the speed uh, that this is being done, it could take two, three weeks, could take four weeks, could take five weeks, could take six weeks. We haven't done enough of them to get a really good distribution to see what the mean is, but that is a, an unpredictable component of the timing. Once all of that is done, once the access agreement um, has been prepared, everybody agrees to it and everything is signed, then the raw data are provided to the approved investigators. And we have enough experience now to know that we can do this uh, in five working days. So once the access agreement is done, it takes us five working days to place uh, the data set on the cloud on a cloud and to uh, email the applicants, the approved applicants, give them a certain number of downloads and a password and they download and they're good to go. So in essence, uh, it's not a very long process. We have one piece of the process though that is a little bit unpredictable. I was asked to talk about costing. So for costing, uh, the overall plan has always been uh, to provide the data and the biospecimens, although that's uh, for a little bit later, on a cost, a cost recovery basis. This is not a profit-making organization, it's cost recovery. The figure that we've come up with at this point, and this relates to the amount of time and the amount of energy and resources is it takes to prepare a data set, an alphanumeric data set, is we have set the, the cost at $3,000. And we have also implemented and already sent out the data in this way that there is no cost for the data for graduate student theses. So if a graduate student is making an application and the data are for their thesis, there is no cost. But for investigators, uh, at this point, there is a cost. We are rediscussing this. Uh, we have heard uh, from researchers, some who say, well, that's quite reasonable. Uh, so quite a reasonable cost, given the fact that you don't have to collect the data yourself. Uh, you, you know, you're getting this data, essentially, from, from another source. Other people are saying that $3,000 uh, is a barrier. Uh, to the use of the data. So we are really rediscussing that. We're early stages of data release, so we have to rediscuss this. We have a data and sample access committee, uh, and for, for 2015, we've already had one meeting, and we're planning four more meetings uh, this year. We can't take, uh, at least from a practical perspective, we can't take applications on an ad hoc basis because we have to ramp up everything each time uh, we get the application, so it's much more practical for us to set specific uh, dates for, for the, the meetings. So what we've done is we've set application deadlines, and then the meeting takes place usually within two weeks uh, of the application deadline. So these are the application deadlines uh, that I've listed here for 2015. I just wanted to show you, um, sorry I can't do this in real time, is we have developed a data preview portal, and there's the, the web address. It's quite simple. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of bells and whistles. It's got big boxes uh, for you to click on. You can click on the CLSA overview uh, box, and that will take you to the documents uh, that are of interest to you. 
the questionnaires, the protocol, some of the technical documents about the sampling weights, etc. You can then, you can also click on uh, to the middle box, which is called data sets. And once you do that, you'll see this, and what you'll actually see is that you're able to click on the variables and do a quick search and get some descriptive uh, statistics. So I'm going to take you to the next slide where you see. So here you get the list of variables, um, and if you want to click on any of those variables, you will get univariate descriptive statistics. So if you want to just click on, I can't do it because I can't do it in real time. If you want to just click on sex, then you're going to get a little table that tells you the percentage of males and females. We've only done this univariously. Uh, it's still a, a, sl a little bit of a work in progress, a lot of data, kind of a, a novel feature that we've, in we've introduced for the CLSA, so bear with us if it might take a little bit longer for you to do that. And this is only available uh, for the alphanumeric data for the tracking cohort at this point in time. So I just want to give you an example of some approved applications. Not all of these people have yet um, completed the process of the access agreements and had the data released to them, but we've got applications from uh, across the country, consumer product related seniors, neurological conditions, here we are hearing loss and social function, veterans, uh, looking at retirement transitions, expectations and planning. This is a, a student application, so it was, and this is actually data that has been released already and have been provided uh, at no charge. Who's at risk of social isolation and loneliness? Uh, an application from the student companion animals and the aging population. Again, uh, these data have not yet re been released. They're still working on uh, the administrative aspects here, uh, but these will be released free of charge. Sectorial invariance of the um, CES, the depression scale, and development of normative data and comparison standards for cognitive measures. So these are just a selection. Uh, we have a, a few more in, in the pipeline uh, that we're working on some of the details that so far that these data have been approved. So, uh, linkage, I don't want to forget to talk about linkage. Linkage is key. Uh, we do active data collection. There is also the possibility of passive data collection and then linkage of these passive, so-called passive data uh, to the information in our cohort. So obviously, uh, you know, administrative provincial health databases, and we're working on that. We have strategies to work on that. Disease registries, population level databases, community characteristics, climate and pollution. And I'm really happy, and this is really hot off the press, uh, we have um, largely due to the hard work of Parminder Reina, uh, he's been able to create a collaborative agreement with Health Canada to, to get pollution data on the participants in the CLSA. And in fact, uh, just this past week, we received uh, the information and actually linked the pollution data uh, for the 21,241 uh, individuals in the tracking cohort. So we haven't got any of that information yet on the website, but just to say we've actually done that, which really enhances uh, the information that is available in the, in the CLSA uh, platform. Collaborations, Nancy's mentioned a few. Uh, right now we're obviously collaborating with the Canadian Consortium on Neurodegeneration in Aging. One of the things that we've done, because it is quite complex to, to create this kind of a collaboration, is we've created a liaison committee. Uh, and I suspect that that would be a strategy that we would use for other large collaborations, is to create a liaison committee to ensure that both groups uh, are clear on their expectations and, and responsibilities. So that's going well. We also have currently uh, submitted an application to CIHR to develop some brain imaging, which currently is not being done uh, in the CLSA. We've got lots of partners um, who have worked with us uh, providing funding or providing data or just providing uh, a lot of support to us through PHAC, we worked on injuries and the neurological conditions, Health Canada, Veterans Affairs, Statistics Canada uh, has been very helpful in the early days, giving us methodological input and uh, some information on the, the sampling rights. Ontario Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, the provinces and, and the universities. So there are many more partners in this, but uh, I just thought I would list some of those. Uh, I'm going to take a couple of minutes to talk about the follow-up because um, right now I've just talked about the snapshot, the cross-sectional data. So we're going to start the follow-up, uh, as I said, this summer. We're going to be recontacting every one of our participants. Uh, the tracking by telephone and the others are going to be contacted to redo uh, the in-home and the DCS collaboration. So that's 
high on our agenda for planning. What's interesting, uh, might be interesting for you to know, is that for the first follow-up, we're, we're proposing some new content. We, we've, in collaboration, for instance, with the PHAC, we're going to be adding child maltreatment questions, elder abuse. We're adding an epilepsy screening tool. We're adding additional questionnaire questioning on hearing, arterial stiffness. Or we're adding a decedent questionnaire because we will be contacting participants to find out that they will have died uh, since the last time we were speaking to them. So we're going to be uh, we're developing the process of developing that. We're adding workability. We've added subjective cognitive decline questions. Transportation module, pumping up a little bit from what we had before. Healthcare use, we just actually discussed that this morning uh, in our regular weekly call, and, pre and preventive uh, health behaviors. So we're not, this is not a static study where we just repeat the same thing over and over again without taking into account uh, new research questions and things that uh, other researchers have suggested to us should be part uh, of the CLSA. Uh, we also, um, in our follow-up funding, have been funded to analyze some of the baseline biomarkers because up until now there was no funding available through the CIHR fund to actually do analysis uh, of the biomarkers or even of uh, the alphanumeric data. Uh, I think I'm going to, even though that's incredibly important, I think I'm going to skip that slide uh, just so that I can be sure we have a lot of time for questions. I see them coming in. Uh, again, this is just a list of the funders and the partners. Um, I don't think anybody is going to be reading that in great detail. You can always find that on our website. I do want to talk a little bit about our governance uh, and our advice that we receive. A study of this size has to have a lot of components to keep it going. So we have um, a scientific management team. Uh, we meet weekly, the, the PIs and our associate scientific director and our uh, executive uh, national manager meet weekly. We also have an international scientific advisory board. And as I'm reading this, I realize I've forgotten our advisory council. We have a scientific advisory board and we also have an advisory council. We, of course, have the data and sample access committee. We have a knowledge translation and communication committee, a training and research committee. And we're very fortunate um, to have an ethical legal social issues advisory committee uh, who are part of CIHR, uh, where, and we have used these individuals and this committee over the years um, many times to get advice on various aspects of the study related to the ethical, legal, and social issues. For those of you who are saying, well, where and how do I you know, put in an ask okay. for dollars um, for uh, the access costs for CLSA. Now, some of you will already have funds that you can use for that purpose, um, and and uh, you can be out the door, I guess, right away. But um, for others, uh, if you are thinking about an application um, either to the project scheme or the foundation scheme as part of our open operating program, or you're submitting something under uh, CIHR priority-driven initiatives, so that could be the work and health initiative, the environment health and, uh, signature initiative, and so on, then you can put in as a budget line um, the cost for accessing the data or the samples. These are considered eligible expenses within the research applications. Um, and uh, just a note here, and Christina, you might want to add to this, uh, but each unique data access request uh, may involve separate data access fees. So you want to be aware of that when you are preparing your budget. Um, and I think, Christina, you might want to elaborate. I saw a couple of questions coming in that were sort of getting at that, at that very query. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'll, this is a, a, an issue that we have been discussing. It hasn't happened yet, but I can certainly see, I, I think what we're talking about is the difference between a request for data for a single project versus request for data for a program. So if someone has several interconnected projects. I think it's very difficult to give a single answer to that without having an example in front of us. I mean, what, what of course we don't want, and we don't expect researchers to do this, but we don't want people to say, look, let's all get together and put in a, a request and we want all the data and we'll only have to pay once. Um, I think that we're going to try and be very judicious uh, about how we apply these fees. The point is not to make money on this. The point is just to enable us to, have to keep the resources 
flowing here, for instance, at the Statistical Analysis Center, so that we can get the data out in a more timely fashion by having the right number of staff. Um, so I think I'm going to, for the moment, I'm going to dodge so an answer to that point, question. Um, I think we have to think that about it a little bit more carefully. Preparing an application that has that question would contact the CLSA team. Um, yeah, I think that's I think that's very wise. I think I you know either me directly or our access email address and and give us the heads up uh, that something like that is coming and we can give you uh, advice on on how we feel about it because I think that there are so many permutations and combinations of and what is happening. Um, very difficult. You know, you're getting some repeat uh, questions and so on. Um, these are things that might also appear on your website as a frequently asked question where you had a chance as a team then to discuss it and how you're going to address it. So I, yes. I think both the questions we're getting today but other questions that you will get will, will really help with uh, uh, trying to uh, sort out some of these, these uh, issues and various permutations as you say. Well, that, that's exactly it. So that's why you know, doing something like this and in every presentation we give, it, it's very valuable because we get questions I've been so close to this for, for 14 years, so we get questions that maybe we haven't thought about and, and we have to come up with a way to address them. So that's incredibly helpful for us to, to do what's best for the research community Great. and what also works for the CLSA. Okay, thanks, Tina. That and I think that there's some people still critical. having some trouble with uh, the volume, so um, okay. first maybe try on your computer for those of you having trouble to turn up the volume, but okay. I'll just uh, I'll speak closer to the microphone and ask Tina to do the same. Um, so what I'd like to do now is uh, just take an opportunity to start to address some of the questions yeah. that have been put into the chat mechanism. There are a few that have, have uh, queued up and um, as uh, Nancy and Tina have alluded to, I think a frequently asked questions um, piece and incorporating some of this would be, would be fabulous. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to first, since we're on the theme of um, the Data Act Preview Portal, um, I'll, I'll just read you some of the questions, Tina. I think most of them will come your way um, and ask you to respond. So one, one question was related to the cost for um, the data access and you indicated that there was no cost for, for graduate students' uh, thesis, but is uh, there a cost for postdocs? At this point, uh, I would say yes. Uh, okay. So but I think that that's an excellent question. Okay, and then and then in the FAQ, well, leave, it, leave it with me, and we'll put it on okay. the agenda. So great question, thank you for that. Um, and will a list yeah, of the applications yeah. and the status of those applications be posted on an ongoing basis on the CLSA website so that people can um, see what's happening and ultimately reduce duplication of effort? Yes, uh, right now there are already uh, a number that have been posted, and what we ask. Uh, the applicants to put in their access application form is a summary that we can post on the website if their application is approved. So we have some up there, uh, but there are others that are not yet up there because they're still part of the administrative process and we, we have to tweak some of the wording. So yes, absolutely that's essential because that's a very important point. We, you know, I think you know, if someone sees that someone else is working on something they're familiar with, it'd be great if they make the contact. They might do something different okay, that they're proposing. Um, so another yes, question, um, will the data be presented relative to the Canadian Community Health Survey or the, the Canadian Health Measures Survey and Ontario or other provincial health surveys? Okay, do you, I, I think this question was, was asking me this in terms of this presentation, I think. So I think you know the answer to that. I didn't present it. Uh, we have done analyses in relation to the CCHS. Um, I, I haven't presented them here and, and of course, and I think that where we have overlap, I think things are very, very similar. In fact, part of our, as I said before, part of our first sampling framework, the CCHS. Uh, we haven't done um, relative to other uh, studies at this point, as far as I'm aware. I mean, there may be okay, other researchers you. within the CLSA are trying the, to do that. But uh, we another that question yet. around specific data, and, and again, when researchers, I, I did post the link to the CLSA data access site so people can see the detailed questionnaire and such, but if you want to answer one yeah. question here, do you, do you have data related to musculoskeletal disorders, for example, low back pain, um, and did you do muscle strength measurements? 
Okay, so I'm going to, uh, I would actually ask this individual to go to the website and have a look at the questionnaire. Certainly in the telephone interview, clearly we, we have no muscle strength uh, measurements. I, I think I'm going to say we don't really have a lot on that, even in the data collection site. Uh, but absolutely go to the website, pull out the questionnaire and, and the measures that we use, and you'll get a much better idea whether okay, for and your this question. Next one, it may be on the website, are, are, are but the um, it's around the cognitive impairment. Um, which criteria did you use for excluding or for excluding cognitive, those with yeah. cognitive impairment? It was happening over there, but anyway. Um, I, I, I did try to answer that, I think, in the middle, that in fact we use the same strategy that Statistics Canada uses in the CCHS. They train their, their interviewers. Um, we use no specific cognitive screen, that's for sure. Uh, uh, Tina, this is from Indra. Can I add uh, answer yes. to one of your answers? Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, I think the question that was uh, asked about the low back pain in our comprehensive, the 30,000 one, yes. there are questions in the disease symptom questionnaire if the person goes yes. and looks at their uh, right. There are uh, things about low back pain, and also we have uh, reasonable amount of performance testing, including grip strength. Grip strength, okay. I, I, I was thinking, I'm getting a little, okay, okay, okay. Uh, just getting back to the cognitive uh, impairment, as I said, we use the same strategy that CCHS used. Uh, obviously, when people come in, we are assessing them, we do. Uh, fair amount of, of cognitive assessment already. And as I said, there are some people who self-reported that they did have cognitive impairments and they did have Alzheimer's disease. So we had to stick with the same strategy that we that CCHS used because we started with that as a sampling frame. I'm trying to flip through to see if there are any. Yeah, there another any one questions. here, Tina, um, the data collection on falls that you do. Uh, do you yeah. collect data on whether these falls were resulting in fractures or hospital admissions? And I believe so. <laughs> I believe so. Uh, I don't have the questionnaire uh, off the top of my head. Uh, we, we are, I can answer the second part, is right now we are not verifying um, clinical events uh, by access to medical records. Uh, the ultimate goal is to link with uh, health administration databases, but currently we are not checking with medical records. Um, another question here, are linked data considered part of CLSA or each, does each investigator need to request previously linked data um, for his or her use? Okay, that's an excellent question. Um, we have, at this point in time, only one linkage that's been made. Uh, and that's with the air pollution data. So we have to, we work very closely with whatever organization or individuals agree to link the data with the CLSA database to ensure that on both sides, whatever kind of um, access agreements are required, we're covered. So I think at, at our level, we, we make sure that whoever is making that request, we're, we're in line with whoever's providing the data that we're linking as well as the CLSA. So the goal is that individuals should be able to get it through us, but there may be exceptions where they have to go separately to get approval from the source of the linked data. So it's going to depend on the linkage itself, I think. At Parminder, I think this is a place where you might be able to add a word or two if you wear a headset. Uh, I'm just looking for the headset. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, okay, I think the part of the question was in relation to uh, data linkage with the provincial registries and uh, many of you who know how the provincial registries, healthcare data registries work, it belongs to each jurisdiction. We have been working with the data stewards and some of the privacy commissioners across the country to figure out a way that we actually do a one single application that allows you to link data across different jurisdictions. And then these data are actually housed, whether it's with CLSA or some other entity where people can go and re-access that data for a different types of question. Uh, we are trying to work out a process where we will like to avoid that research every time there is a data linkage uh, project comes up that they have to go and apply to CLSA and then apply to the 
uh, provincial agency then get the data link and once the project is finished, you actually give up that linked data. Uh, that is happening now and we are trying to work out a process that we can do a better coordinated uh, uh, process in a way that allows you to house the existing linked data for the future uh, projects. I don't know if that, I think that was the intent of the question. Yeah, there is another question which relates to this also, which is will linkage studies requiring access to data held at ISIS in Ontario need to go through a separate approval process? And I think yeah, what Parminder has said is that we're working on ways to make these things uh, easier rather than harder. So I think each one of these each one of these questions that you ask is, is actually going to lead into us saying how can we do this and how can we do this and how can we do that? At this point in time our goal has been to work with the ministry directly because if you let's say go through ISIS then you ha we have to send our data to ISIS, they do the linkage, they do the analysis because right now maybe in the near future they will have a mechanism but they do not have a mechanism of sending data to the researchers for the purposes of analysis. So for that very reason, right now we were having conversations directly with the ministry uh, to see if we can set up a different provision to access these data that are available to researchers uh, a little bit more freely to do the analysis. So Parminder and Tina, Nancy here, um, I presume what that would mean for a researcher who is putting together an application, for instance, to use CLSA data and they wanted to link it with a provincial administrative data set um, through the open competition, that it would be advisable for them to be connecting with you as they are preparing that um, application to make sure that the procedures that they're outlining for that linkage, for the access and so on, is in line with what's possible. Is that correct? Uh, absolutely, and I, I think it's uh, it's important to note that you know we cannot release health insurance numbers uh, outside to individual researchers. So if anybody's thinking about that, they should contact us sooner rather than later, and we can help you know work on it together to figure out a way to get it done. Back to that, we are also actually setting up a working group over the next few months that will engage in a pilot project in a coordinated fashion in data access and data linkage with uh, uh, different processes or provinces and that will address some of the questions that are coming our way from the audiences today, how that will work. But Tina is right uh, that they should connect with us if they have a data linkage uh, proposal uh, because there is a, quite a bit of a coordination that needs to happen in order for it to be successful. So I'll just add to that and something I didn't even mention here is that for in addition to requests for data, we get a lot of requests for letters of support uh, for people who are putting in proposals. And we are happy to provide such letters of support, but it is very helpful if we can get advance notice that this is coming uh, rather than, you know, two days before the grant is due because that helps us in two ways. Certainly it, it helps us have time to prepare it, but it also allows us to perfect, perhaps provide some advice to the applicant uh, if they have a misunderstanding of what might be available or doable within the CLSA. So sooner rather than later uh, is kind of our, our, our motto. So two days before is bad news. What do you, ideally, would it, is this like two months in advance? Uh, month I, th in I think if someone, I mean, I just think of myself as a researcher. If, if I'm going to be using a, a data source that I actually don't yet have access to, I think as soon as I start thinking about this and say, saying I want to write a grant application, I think that's the time to actually have a preliminary discussion, uh, even without a grant application, because we might be able to, uh, you know, correct a misinterpretation so that you don't go too far down the road. Uh, so as soon as you start thinking about it, I mean, I think my, I'll speak for myself. I'm happier to get a, a request and be able to say to someone, yes, this looks great here's some information that you might use or I don't think we can do that at all. I, will, I would prefer to do that than to have to tell someone who spent a month writing a grant application and has engaged a lot of different people and they have a fundamental, they've missed something that they, they didn't realize about the CLSA. Yeah, very, very helpful advice. I think sometimes people kind of hesitate because they're not sure that they have their ideas sort of, you know, really fully formed and so on. but. Uh, 
a, the, the strong advice here is sooner rather than later. And in, and indeed, I guess in that interaction um, with you, there may be some other aspects people haven't thought about, and it may help to shape the um, the approach that they want to take. Okay, I'll go to another question here. Um, it was one asked earlier, do, do you plan to replace those who are lost? So I guess the participants who, who drop out or um, are not taking part in the study for the, for, for the subsequent follow-ups. Okay, we don't have a plan in place to do that at this point. Uh, I think that that's something that is going to be rediscussed at each time frame. I mean, you, we all know the, the scientific methodological challenges of doing that. Uh, but right now, it, it's a closed cohort. You know, you start at a particular point, and then we, we watch the cohort uh, decline in size uh, over time. Uh, clearly, some of our endpoints are going to depend on, on getting some of those negative endpoints. But um, right now, there is no specific plan. It's, certainly, we've discussed it. Uh, but right now, there's no specific plan. Okay, thank you, Tina. Um, is there a plan to ask participants about organizational factors that may have contributed to early or involuntary retirement? I'm going to have to ask what you mean by organizational factors. Yeah, because the person, um, I guess Sarah, if you, if you want to clarify your question and then we'll come back to it. I'm just scanning to see some other questions here. Yeah, I, I, just if I can add for the retirement question, we do ask uh, people questions about reasons for their retirement and yeah. one of the reasons tends to be whether it's related to the workplace, changes in workplace organizational changes yeah. that, uh, that are a cause of that uh, early retirement, let's say. Yeah. Um, and Tina, what are the criteria that applications are evaluated against in, I guess this would be the data and sample access committee? Yeah. Okay, so, so what we've been doing uh, so far, I mean obviously one of the things we have to look at is whether whether the request fits in within the, the CLSA con consent that the participants have consented to. So we do that. Obviously, you know, there are a bunch of, there are researchers, on, uh, every, everyone on the data and sample access committee is a researcher. We, we get a mixture of applications. So we get some applications that have already been reviewed and approved by a granting agency and at that stage we don't really need to do scientific review. Uh, we get applications that have gone through protocol defenses for, for students, so we don't have to do scientific review. Sometimes we get applications that have not had, uh, and we ask, have not had any kind of a, a scientific review. So we do do a scientific review within the confines of the expertise uh, of the committee, uh, because we, and, and oftentimes what happens if the committee has some questions is they come back to the applicant as recommendations. You know, don't. Perhaps you might want to consider, for example, these variables as confounders. But fundamentally, if it's clear what the applicant is proposing to do, it's clear that it fits in with the consent, uh, you know, what variables they want are available in the CLSA, then generally that kind of an application would be approved. So there's not a rigorous major scientific review because for the most part that's done elsewhere. I see the next question is interesting. Will researchers be tempted to recruit graduate students to the request the data so that their professors or supervisors can have the data for free? I just say I hope not. I think I have, uh, I don't expect my colleagues will do that. Okay, and I've got uh, Sarah um, clarified her question so around the organizational policy um, or supervisor behavior that made it less appealing to continue working, so I guess something that might yes. be in the free text? Yes, yes. So that's in there, uh, Tina? I believe so. Okay. Because, yeah. So uh, maybe Tina, you could just expand on what the plans are then to release the free text. You talked about the alphanumeric responses, yes. but um, yes. will free text uh, eventually be um, available as well? Yes, it's not, it, it's not all of the open text that isn't available. The, the major components of the open text that are not available right now uh, for the tracking is the labor force, the, the, the occupational coding. That's the major part. Most of the rest of it has been uh, coded. Uh, some of it is going to be available as open text because there are some things, as long as we make sure that we're not violating any confidentiality, we would release it as open text. Uh, others have been coded in, in natural coding categories. Um, there are people who are interested in doing qualitative analyses on some of the open text. 
that is primarily the labor force, the, the occupational coding that has not yet been done. The others have hey, been coded. Another question, um, Tina, around the section of the 60-minute tracking questionnaire on alcohol use. Are there any questions related to prescription drug use or illicit drug use? In the tracking right now, we do not um, have a medication module, but we have added uh, medication use to the maintaining contact for the tracking participants. So that's been asked. That is being asked right now. Illicit drugs, I have to look at the questionnaire. I uh, no, we don't ask anything about illicit drugs, and so the tracking 60 minute, as Tina mentioned, there are some questions in the maintaining contact, but most of the prescription drug, drugs are to be obtained through linking it with uh, uh, drug databases uh, for certain age groups, mostly people over the age of 65 or people who are in social assistance. That's what most of the provinces do. And in some provinces, it's just available for younger people. And another question about what's in the, the data, um, asking if data regarding recreational activities, community programs, the arts, and exercise is, is in there? Okay. So in the tracking, the, the physical activity questions are being asked in the maintaining context, so are not available in this first release. And that was actually a, a comment that a number of participants wrote to us and said, how come you didn't ask me? about my physical activity, and that was really a question of space uh, at that point, but it is being asked in the maintaining contact. Um, and the other activities are included, in, some of those would be included in the social participation component of the tracking. Yeah, thank you, Tina. Another question around the cost for data access, and I know that you've mentioned this is still something that you're, you're discussing within the CLSA, but um, some comments about the, the cost for the data access and that many countries have developed um, similar studies, but don't um, charge these kind of data access, data sets costs. Um, do you plan to charge the cost continuously as the survey gets stable, or is it just the, the initial setup? That's a really hard question for me to answer because as the director of the statistical analysis center, you know, I have 1.7 full-time equivalents, uh, and it, yep. you're underfunded for, for, for this activity, so part of these, I mean, this is a cost recovery activity, and until we find the alternative or additional funds to support uh, the whole data access uh, and data release process, then I think we're going to struggle with uh, whether or not to, to charge. And I think, and I'm, I'm speaking for myself, just in terms of, of getting the work done where I am, if we don't have some additional funding for this, either through cost recovery or other sources, it's going to take longer for uh, applicants to, to get their data because we're going to have an increasing number of applications and not an increasing number of staff to prepare them. So this, this is a, you know, I throw that out there as the reality, my daily reality. I would love to be able to uh, release these data at no cost and I, and I, if I'm not mistaken, many of the other studies around the world actually have major funding uh, for data release that, that we don't have at the CLSA. So I, I share your share your pain, um, and we are discussing this. Uh, and I, I raised it myself here in, even in this discussion, so we are discussing it. Okay, I'm, I'm scanning the chat, and I think I've addressed all the uh, questions that uh, have been listed. So if I haven't, uh, please just um, type, type it back in if you don't mind. And a couple of people have asked if the slides would be made available after, and yes, indeed, they will. And I believe the session has been recorded, so that recording could be made available to you or your colleagues as well. Yeah, I, I did want to an answer one question, which I saw as I was going by, about how come there are 23 people with dementia. Just remembering this is a telephone interview, and it's a self-report uh, at this point in time. So that, that's as much information as I have. I mean, maybe the screening process isn't uh, as good as we would like it to, to be. Uh, or people are misinformed as to or misheard the question. So it's really self-report. And I think one other question here, um, uh, uh, who was writing from Hong Kong or who is involved at a Hong Kong Polytechnic University. So uh, can somebody who is working outside of Canada um, access the data and, and would it be the same procedures or is it different? Um, for the alphanumeric data, so let's just talk about the tracking for the moment, yes. Uh, these data are accessible to researchers outside the country through the same 
process. I just don't, I'm not quite sure how the CLSA access agreement is going to work internationally, but, you know, if we get an example, we'll sort it out. Um, for the link, for linked data, particularly with respect to the health registration databases or health administration databases, that at this point in time we're not able to share, uh, but as Parmenter has already mentioned, we're trying to work on a strategy to be able to do that. But the, the pure alphanumeric data, the self-report and the questionnaire, yes, uh, are theoretically available. Uh, if you are planning to put in an application from outside Canada, please give me the heads up so we can get ourselves ready in case there are additional questions that we have to uh, address. Okay, and uh, one final, uh, there's a question that is, uh, can someone request data by occupation, is that possible? Uh, qu uh, quest data by occupation. Well, um, we have limited available information because I, I said that the, uh, the open texts are not yet coded. So if someone puts in an application and they, what they want to do is to look at uh, certain occupations and health or whatever it is that you're interested in, then certainly put in the proposal and say these are the, the variables that you want and then you will get the raw data and you can do the analyses yourself. Yeah, no, I was just going to clarify one comment in relation to access to data outside the country. Uh, uh, I think if you, on our website, there is a data access policy and we have a, like Christina mentioned, we have a caveat in relation to, because even though uh, technically it is possible, but some of the ethics and consent issues uh, have to be worked out for us to figure out how we release these data to outside researchers. I think alphanumeric data would be relatively easy once we have worked out the process, but the biological samples are actually quite tricky uh, from uh, shipping out of the country, especially when you have provinces like Quebec and, and Newfoundland where there are founders populations. So it's a work in progress from our side. We have not shipped data, and in our data and access sample policy, uh, we actually say there's a caveat that we are in process of working out uh, what the process of sharing that information would be. Okay, thank you, Parminder. Um, so just as we wrap up the, the webinar, I would like to invite both Tina and uh, Nancy to make any final concluding comments um, and just to say that these questions can be rolled into a frequently asked questions document um, but I would encourage you to forward um, um, or to communicate with those on the, the speakers today. I'll, I'll post their contact information. You'll see it on the screen there now. So um, I'll start with Nancy if you want to make some concluding remarks. To, um, to Tina for a very thorough presentation and clear explanations and to Parminder for uh, jumping in there with some um, uh, helpful explanations and to all of you for joining us and uh, for some uh, excellent questions. Uh, it's exactly these kinds of questions I think we need to sort of proceed to the next phases as we get the, uh, the imagination of uh, fantastic researchers um, out in Canada on ways in which this data might be used and that's ex exactly, um, you know, as a funding agency what we're looking for. The, the success of the CLSA, we're, we're already seeing that, but the extent to which it actually gets used as um, a platform for a lot of um, important questions um, will be the, the mark of success for this initiative. So I think this is just the start of the discussion and um, uh, just a big thanks uh, for me for uh, taking the time to jo join us and to team and Prime Minister. Thank you. And, and Tina, any concluding remarks or Parminder? I, I, I just wanted to say thank you for the opportunity to do this and I, I really do reiterate that I'm very happy to take questions. You have my email address here because it's much better for all of us if the questions come sooner rather than later. It helps us uh, to plan. It, it helps us to, it gives us an ideas to think about that we might not have thought of and hopefully it will make your life easier in your in our goal, which is that you should be using the CLSA data as soon as possible. Thank you. Well, we'll, we'll thank you all for participating. I hope you found this webinar to be useful. I, I think that it's just fabulous that the data is available now, so encourage you all to contact the CLSA with your questions. So thanks again, everyone, and have a great day.